thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks to uh, Town Hall for hosting this, and thank you all for, on a Friday night, coming out to Pure Political Talk. So, I wrote a book about lies that's published in 2016, and every reporter I speak to says, isn't that so fortuitous for you? You know, in a year of Donald Trump, you published a book about lies. And I've been thinking about that. And the truth is, it's, it's actually not fortuitous. Um, it, it's actually, it, it goes to exactly what's wrong and almost exactly what I talk about in my book. Lies are a corrupting influence on our political process. They're as corrupting as money, they're as corrupting as lobbying. In fact, the three work together. And the problem with Donald Trump and his lies is they're like Jack Abramoff and lobbying. You know, Jack Abramoff was this super lobbyist in Washington, D.C., who ends up going to prison in one of the most ridiculous lobbying scandals of all time. I'm being ridiculous. I don't mean that it was ridiculous he meant it went to jail. I mean it was ridiculous. The actual schemes he pulled were almost comical in their evilness. So, for example, taking one Indian tribe as a, a client to defend their casinos and then getting Christian groups to advocate against the Native American tribes' casinos and then telling the Native American tribe, oh, you need to give me more money to defend us against these Christian groups that he himself had gotten into the process. You know, those schemes were ridiculous. But that's not the problem. The problem with corruption in Washington, as I think we all agree, isn't the ridiculous. It's the everyday corruption. The problem with money in politics isn't the insanity. It isn't the insanity of, of million dollar contributions, though that's a problem. The bigger problem is if you're going to be a member of Congress today, what you have to do, you, and there's literally sample schedules like this. You can look them up online. If When you're running for Congress, the DCCC or the NRCC will hand you a sheet so this is what your day is like as a member of Congress. Wake up, 8 a.m., do, do a fundraising breakfast. Then go make phone calls for four hours to, to get donations. Then maybe do two hours of you know, co committee work, two hours of, of Congress work, and then go raise more money. And literally our members of Congress every day go to these rooms for the Democrats on South Capitol Street, for the Republicans across from the Capitol South Metro, and they sit in phone rooms and they're literally telemarketing to people who can give checks of $2,000. And that's a, that's a legal and accepted and corrupting influence on our democracy because what happens when somebody is spending their day talking to people who can give you $2,000 checks? Obviously, the issues they think about, what they hear, how they, how they react, end up being about the people who can give $2,000 checks. And we don't talk about that because we talk about the ridiculous, already illegal lobbying scandals and not the fact that our entire system is corrupted. So in terms of lies, we talk about Donald Trump and his clownish behavior. The problem is lies are an everyday corrupting influence. And how I got to this point was in 2012, uh, I wrote a book about Fox News called The Fox Effect, which meant I watched a lot of Fox News, which is kind of hazardous to one's health. There's actually, it's funny, but there's actually a movie about that out right now. Jen Senko uh, directed a film, a uh, documentary called The Brainwashing of My Father, or uh, The Brainwashing of My Dad, that actually shows her father's descent into madness from absorbing conservative media. And I actually highly recommend that film. But watching Fox News, you quickly realize something when you watch a lot of Fox News. Fox doesn't invent anything. Basically what they do is they get two people up there to yell at each other with a host. They don't, they don't do real journalism. Their business model is let's have two people yell at each other and a right-leaning host moderate the debate. And that's a good business model. But it means that the lies on Fox News aren't created by Fox. Somebody else has to invent them. So after I was done with the Fox effect, I got obsessed. I said, who's inventing these lies? Because I, I think of lies like zombies. Once a lie comes out, it never goes away. So if there's a zombie apocalypse, there's going to be a patient zero in the zombie apocalypse. So I said, where, where is patient zero? Who's inventing um, death panels? Who's inventing the idea that more guns 
equal less crime. Who, who came up with the notion uh, when Todd Aiken in 2012, the Missouri senator said that uh, if, a woman has a, if a woman is raped, she can't get pregnant, uh, and that cost him a Senate campaign, but who, who came up with that? Because Todd Aiken clearly didn't. He said it 100% believing what he was saying was true, which is odd, because that, that means he wasn't actually lying, because when you're lying, you have intent. That's the, you can say something that's untrue, and you can, and you, or you lie, right? He was saying something that was completely untrue and he should have known better, but he wasn't lying. But there had to be somebody at the source of that. And I started looking, and what did I find? I found on issue after issue after issue over the past seven years, there was a small group of people who invented the lies that are specifically designed to distort and disrupt our democracy. They, these are people who have, fat, like a hacker, like a hacker looks at a computer system and says, let me find the weakness in that system and exploit it. These people, who I identify in Lies Incorporated, are hackers of democracy. They look, they found a weakness in our system, a weakness in our media culture, a weakness in our democracy, and they have decided that their job is to exploit that weakness. So, I started digging and I found this group and what did I find? I found they were you know, all individuals who profited, but profited in two ways. And this is something interesting because we think about climate denial, right? Very standard lie. You think about the scientists who are ExxonMobil scientists, et cetera, the people who represent climate denial uh, organizations like the Heartland Institute. And you say they're lying because they got paid, right? That's the, that's the typical, thing. They, you know, they got paid off to lie. Now, some of them got paid, and, and frankly, the money's nice for them, but when you dig down, that's actually not the motivation. This is, this is what's interesting. Their motivation is ideological. The money is kind of tangential to the ideology, and it creates a sweet spot of ideology and motivation. And what, how do I know it's about ideology? Well, first, other people have done brilliant research on this. Namely, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway at Harvard University wrote a book called Merchants of Doubt about, uh, some, about the scientists behind the tobacco industry and the science behind the climate industry. And you see, who were they? They were Cold War scientists. They were people who had worked on our missile systems and satellite programs and came up believing the most important thing they could do was beat the Russians. And then they started thinking, wait a second, if we have increased regulations, that just leads to communism. So we have to fight against any intervention of government in, in terms of a regulatory manner, in terms of an increased state. And by the way, you see uh, these days a bunch of conservatives in the climate denial community, do you know what they call uh, environmentalists? People who you know, want to save the planet from warming? They call, they call them watermelons. Why? Because they're green on the outside and red on the inside. They use, they use that language. And this is, and so you see these scientists. You see scientists, you know, siding with tobacco, siding with climate based on this ideological narrative. One of the first uh, tobacco scientists was this brilliant professor who, and this is the 1950s and 60s, who was a eugenicist. And he believed that genetics were the cause of all maladies and only genetics. So therefore, smoking couldn't cause cancer because genetics had to. And if, if they proved that smoking caused cancer, it would call into question his own life's work. And that, that's the type of structure you see among these people. Sure, a lot of them have made a lot of money. A lot of them have gotten not super wealthy, but made a good living. But the main thing is these are ideological warriors who believe that what they are doing by creating and inventing and cultivating these lies is furthering their ideology. And they, and they do it for one particular purpose. There's one model here. Lies don't produce change. Lies don't, don't take system X and make it system Y. What lies do, and why they've been so prevalent in the past seven years, and why that was a perfect place to examine, is lies keep us locked in the status quo. So the tobacco industry set up the Tobacco Industry Research Council uh, to 
keep the status quo in place, that we're not gonna regulate tobacco, that they're gonna be able to sell cigarettes. ExxonMobil learns that climate change is real in the late 70s from their own scientists, reconfirms in the 80s and goes out and funds the Heartland Institute and a bunch of other climate denial think tanks. And this is all in now documents that have been made public. Why? Because they know if they can keep the status quo in place, if they can fight to the status quo, they win. That's, that's all they need. Because, and think about it. How much money did tobacco companies make between 19, the 1950s and the 1990s? How much money did they make in that 40-year period? So locking the status quo is profitable. How much have fossil fuel interests made by knowing about climate change and doing nothing from the late 1970s to today? Trillions of dollars. The status quo is profitable. And the, the most amazing thing is when you, I wrote up this whole kind of theory in an initial draft of the book. And what's nice is when you write something up in a book and you're like, this is my theory. And then somebody comes out and just confirms the whole thing for you. That's always nice. And one of the people in my book, kind of a person I start out with because he's such an exaggerated character in the world of Lies Incorporated is a man named Richard Berman. And Richard Berman is a DC uh, lobbyist who if, if you have an evil interest group, if you have a cause that is unpopular, if you need to fight the ugliest fight you can, you hire Richard Berman. And I think I just advertised for him because I think he might say the same thing. Richard Berman, let me, get, let me give you some examples. Richard Berman, in the late 90s, ran a campaign, I'm not joking about this at all, about how Mothers Against Drunk Driving was an evil organization. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, who, uh, that was, by the way, partially funded by Herman Cain, who was at the Restaurant Association at the time, and they didn't want the blood alcohol limits raised and for obvious reasons. They wanted people to drink more at their restaurants, so they paid Richard Berman to run this outlandish campaign. Go to D.C. right now, go downtown in the DuPont Circle area, and you see on the bus stops these billboards, and they have a dog on the billboard, and they say the Humane Society is evil and they kill animals. Why? Because somebody's paying Richard Berman, most likely the fast food industry, who he does a ton of work for, because the Humane Society has run a bunch of rather effective campaigns to make sure that, uh, food, that animals used for food are being treated humanely, which costs them more money. So he runs these asymmetric warfare campaigns. He's also run, one of my favorites was he ran a campaign to tell pregnant women that eating fish is, is great and don't worry about the mercury thing. I mean, this, he's comical in his, in his presentation. Richard Berman was giving, was giving a speech to a bunch of energy industry executives. Came, comes out and gives a speech. And he says to them, my job is to muddy the facts and keep us at the status quo. Be and it was that, so he laid it out in plain English. That is his job. His job isn't to present new theories. His job isn't to create change. His job is to muddy the facts and keep us at the status quo. So if you look at every single issue we have faced over the past, uh, over the Obama presidency, anything where the status quo was being adjusted, there was a moneyed interest group out there fighting to keep the status quo in place and using lies as a weapon. Most prominently, and, and a story that's pretty easily retold is during the gun debate, after Sandy Hook, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden proposed pretty modest gun regulations, frankly, nothing extreme. We're going to expand national background checks, assault weapons ban, and some minor other tweaks. Very kind of light touch gun regulations, which of course caused the NRA to completely freak out. When that bill loses in the Senate, Barack Obama comes out to the Rose Garden, and he says, he says, you know, the NRA defeated this bill, and he he doesn't cite simply the NRA's lobbying muscle, which is some of the most sophisticated lobbying in Washington. He doesn't cite their financial muscle. They're a $200 million organization that donates to 249 members of Congress that year that spends eight figures on elections. He didn't, he didn't talk about that. He said they, they lied about this bill, and that's what defeated it. And the lie they told, by the way, was the bill that Barack Obama proposed uh, would cr create the registration of firearms. And there's nothing gun owners get more scared of than registering firearms. 
So this bill, he said, this bill would cause, they said this bill would cause you'd have to register your weapons. Do you know what the problem with that was? Not only did the bill not say that, the bill actually made it illegal for the government to do it and put criminal penalties on any government figure who tried to register people's firearms. So not only did it not say what they said it said, it actually, the, the, the uh, Joe Manchin, who was the Democratic senator who helped author that legislation, he actually knew this was going to be an attack, so put this provision in to prevent it, and it didn't matter. The lie killed that bill. Now, guns are easy. We think about guns as, you know, Guns are an issue flooded with lies. Let's take an issue that I'm kind of shocked about how lies influence the debate, and that's LGBT equality. So in, the, in that debate, you had, a, you had a group of conservatives who saw the trajectory of what was going on and said, we are going to, we have to stop this. And we see what's going on in court and we need to defend we need to give the government, specifically the House of Representatives who is defending the Defense of Marriage Act, we need to give them a compelling reason uh, for continuing this clear form of discrimination. Because you can't walk into court and go, yeah, we shouldn't have gay marriage because Jesus told me to do it. So they said we need to create a compelling government reason. And the thing they came up with, and this is a specific group, centered around a think tank called the Witherspoon Institute, which was founded by a professor at Princeton named Robert George, who is one of the, is one of the most brilliant ethicists, uh, Catholic ethicists in America, truly a brilliant guy, who also is at the center of every anti-gay group in the country from the National Organization for Marriage down the line. He's founded them, he's been on their boards, he's helped raise money for them. He's kind of the, the hub in that, in that wheel. So his think tank, the Witherspoon Institute, led by a guy named Luis Tellis, goes out and says, you know what we need to do? We need to show that when gay couples have children, their children have worse outcomes in life than children of straight couples. So what they did is they took $750,000 and they paid a professor, they gave a professor named Mark Regnerus at the University of Texas a grant. And Mark Regnerus went out and wrote this thing called the New Family Structure Study, where he claimed to survey thousands of families and determined that gay families, they have worse outcomes in life than their children than straight families. Now, here's the problem. The study was a pile of bunk. And I don't just say that because it's my opinion. The, the study, first off, did, was actually not a comparison of gay families to straight families. As one professor pointed out, one professor who examined the study pointed out, the, uh, the study would have been if your parent went to prison and was raped, you would count as the child of a gay family. That, it, that's not a, a LGBT family. You know, and so what the study actually studied was broken homes versus non-broken homes. It wasn't a study, if you were gonna do that study properly, of a child raised in a stable two-parent family of gay parents and a child raised in a stable two-parent family of straight parents and see what, see what happens over the course of their life. And by the way, when you do that study, you find that there's actually no difference in outcomes. But Professor Regnerus's study shows that in every aspect of their lives, suicide rates, welfare dependency, education rates, salary, like you go down the list, he's like, everything is worse for you if your parents are, are gay. And that became their compelling government reason. And so what was nice about this study, nice is a weird word, is it was done by a professor at the University of Texas, which meant all of his emails were subject to an open records request. So we get to see his conversations with his donors. And we get to see them talking about how they need this study before they get to the, uh, the Supreme Court, how they need this study to help influence these decisions. And they couch it in words like, you know, if we come to an honest conclusion, we'll realize the children of gay families are worse off than straight families, but you see them saying this over and over and over again. And here's the thing, your tax dollars, this is what's incredible, your tax dollars paid for the House of Representatives to defend DOMA in court, and they cited this study that was clearly false. By the way, other groups filed briefs citing this study saying it's completely false, including, for example, Mark Regnerus's professional association, the American Sociological Association, 
came out and said this research isn't true. The, his own department at the University of Texas disassociated themselves from this research. And the journal that published it ended up hiring a reviewer to determine how they ended up publishing this piece of garbage. And the Chronicle of Higher Education interviewed the reviewer and they said, how did you, what did you think of the study? And he said, it's BS. I mean, this was very clearly BS, but there was a money group of interest determined, determined to set the status quo in place and they, had, they went out to donors in the, in the conservative world, namely the Bradley Foundation, which is one of those large-scale conservative foundations that gives away tens of millions of dollars a year that most people have never heard of. And they funded this study through their think tank, the Witherspoon Institute. So it's this circle of money influencing policy. It wasn't, you know, and this is how you get lies corrupting the system. And so I, I started doing this research and I noticed all of these people. And I noticed this is an actual business model. This is an actual way for professors like Mark Regnerus to get grant money. It's a, way for, it's a way for people like Richard Berman to grow clientele. It's a way for a woman like Betsy McCoy, who I, I think is one of the more intriguing liars in the book. Betsy McCoy was the woman who invented the idea of death panels. And what ha this is a really interesting example, death panels. Because here's what, here's what happened with death panels. First off, let's talk about who Betsy McCoy is. Betsy McCoy was a fellow in the 19, early 1990s at a conservative uh, think tank called the Manhattan Institute. She has a doctorate from Columbia University. And she writes an article in the, in the mid-90s called No Exit in the New Republic. This article became famous as the article that took down Hillary Care. Newt Gingrich says it, people like Bob Dole says it, people, people like Bill Kristol say it, they say, this woman gave us the ammunition to take down Hillary Clinton's health care plan in the mid-90s. They all credit her. The problem with that article, it was full of lies. So full of lies that it has been debunked repeatedly and over and over again. The New Republic has apologized for it. The, you know, uh, James Fallows called it one of the worst pieces of journalism uh, of the 1990s, it's, it was horrible and filled with lies. Uh, but it caused Betsy McCoy to rise to prominence in the conservative movement, so much so, she ends up getting elected lieutenant governor of New York State. Now, what happens is George Pataki ends up realizing that maybe this wasn't the best idea to make her lieutenant governor, and he ends up, it ends up her first term as lieutenant governor ends up being a disaster, and George Pataki says, I'm not running with you again and she ends up trying to run as a Democrat against him, which didn't work out either. So this is somebody who's a known liar, somebody who knowingly lied about a health care bill. So Barack Obama starts ginning up for his health care bill, and things start getting written, and Betsy McCoy in the summer of 2009 appears on Fred Thompson's radio show, and she presents to Fred Thompson the idea that Barack Obama's health care bill will kill your grandmother, will kill your disabled child. And, and here's what happens. This is one of the most intriguing cases. Instantly, within days, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, and a number of partisan fact checkers as well say, this is completely false, this is completely bogus. We are, we are in no way, this is completely untrue. They come out and say it straight out. The media did its job right away. But what happens is, about a week later, she writes a column in the New York Post laying out the case she made on Fred Thompson's radio show. Then, a few days after that, Michelle Bachman, the then representative from Minnesota, who you might know from saying insane things on the floor of the House of Representatives, she goes to the floor of the House of Representatives and says, my friend, Betsy McCoy has written this brilliant article, and let me read you this article and tell you how bad Obamacare is going to be. Who sees that speech? Sarah Palin, who goes to her Facebook page in early August and writes a screed on her Facebook page where, she's, where she coins the term death panels, describing what she heard from her friend Michelle Bachman. And she said, there's going to be a death panel that's going to kill our grandmothers and disabled children. And from there, the death panel lie takes off. 
Now, here's what's even more incredible, because we talk about how the media doesn't do its job, right? The media, the media doesn't separate lies from truth. The media lets people lie and get away with it. In this case, they didn't. Within a week of Sarah Palin writing that, 40 separate media organizations, the New York Times, CNN, CBS, you go down the list, pretty much anything you would count as a media organization except Fox News, which I know barely counts as a media organization, but everybody except them published direct stories saying this is a lie. They called it out. I did a poll in March. I wanted to see how many people still believed in the idea of death panels. Uh, and here's what I found, and it's really scary, because now, you know, we're seven years later from this moment, seven years from this debunking, uh, about a month from now, right, is when death panels was created. We've had Obamacare existing now for a few years. I, I haven't noticed a death panel. I don't know about you. I haven't heard about anybody getting appointed to death panels. Um, and so I did a survey. Now Kaiser has been surveying this since Obamacare passed to see what the belief in death panel was, but they kind of fudge the question a little bit. They like, is there a board that determines what medical procedures, you know, is a very, they phrased it very academically. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna use their question, but add the word death panel to it. I'm gonna put a finger on the scale to see if I say death panel, will people just say, no way, that's not true. No, I, I, I know the word death panel is not true. Here's what I found. 60% of Americans either believe death panels exist or are unsure at this point. That includes 50% of Democrats and 74% of Republicans. The, despite the fact the media did its job, the lie stuck. because, And this is where we can bring in Donald Trump a little bit. Why did the lie stick? It's because liars who lie with impunity, who are shameless about the lie, who see the barrier of someone calling you a liar and run right through it. They're able to, and have no shame about it at all, don't care about being called a liar, will go in any venue and do it. They can succeed in implanting the lie in groups of people who are naturally, um, naturally designed because of political biases to believe that lie because it conforms to a set part of their political agenda. So Betsy McCoy is a shameless liar. The media did its job, yet the lie that she told is believed today in a huge, by a huge quantity of people. And this is, this is the Trump problem, right? Because he's the same methodology. Betsy McCoy gets attention because she's an exciting liar. Right? So the end, this is where we get into the, the solution. So the way my book, the, what I wanted my book to be was I wanted to tell the stories of the Betsy McCoys on healthcare, uh, tell the stories of John Lott, the guy who invented the lie that more guns mean less crime. I wanted to tell the story of the Pete Peterson Foundation and the Reinhardt Rogoff study on debt. I wanted to tell the story of these lies that, are, that have affected and manipulated our political process. I didn't want this to be a fact-checking book. This is a story about the people who invent these lies and why they do it and how they do it. But, uh, you know, in writing it, my editor and said, you have to include some solutions, Ari. What, how do we fix this? And, you know, fact-checking is important. But we are, we are fact-checking up the wazoo right now. There is, there is not an, a, a dearth of fact-checking going on right now. That's no longer the problem. There, you know, if you say something, somebody's going to rate it pants on fire. Somebody else is, that's mostly false. Um, you know, there are all these people doing fact-checks. That exists right now. The problem is, in Betsy McCoy's case, in Donald Trump's case, and I'll explain how I relate both of them, is we give... The media allows liars to have a platform when they're an exciting liar. Betsy McCoy was a known liar from her work in the 90s. There was no reason in 2009 the media should have granted her a platform. You don't, you don't have a free speech right to a microphone on CNN. Uh, John Lott, who's a liar on the gun thing, and we could, we could get into uh, a dozen stories about it, about John Lott, who he came up with this more guns, less crime theory, wrote a book called More Guns, Less Crime. That theory has been called into question repeatedly. A panel 
of 16 scientists assembled by the National Academy of Sciences examined the theory. 15 of them said this is no basis in fact. Um, there have been instances where he did a poll, for instance, where he claimed to do a poll, where he said nine out of 10 times somebody brandishes a weapon in self-defense, they don't have to fire that gun. So owning a gun and carrying, it's just about, you know, pull them up, shoot them up and pull them out and you're good. So other academics did what academics do and said, hey, could we get a, um, could we get a copy of your survey results? We'd like to examine them. That would be, that would be great. The, you know, and he said, my server crashed. Sorry, don't have them anymore. Lost it. It's gone. Um, which, there is evidence his server, he did have a computer crash at the time. But one would think if you spent that much money on a survey, you would have kept some amount of the data hard copy. Somebody else would have it. There'd be some way to reassemble it. But he gets a lot of criticism. And he goes out and he says, I'm going to do a new survey. And he does a new survey of about 1,000 people, give or take. And he finds, and he says, look, this shows my first survey was right. Nine out of 10 people who possess, who brandish a weapon, don't have to fire it during, uh, when they're defending themselves. What the survey actually found when you looked at the numbers is seven people out of 1,000 had brandished weapons when they, were, when they had a, uh, a criminal try to rob them or assault them or do whatever now. Seven out of 1,000 shows how incredibly rare that is, first off. And six of those people, six, didn't, uh, didn't have to fire. Now, there are two things that we can tell from that statement. One, uh, uh, elementary school math student who's learning fractions can tell you six out of seven does not equal nine out of 10, first of all. And second, a freshman level statistics student can tell you seven is not a significant number of survey results to base a conclusion on, right? Now, the funny thing about John Lott and why I love this story is John Lott is getting attacked by, not attacked, but critiqued by other scientists in online forums. And suddenly, this woman appears in the online forums named Mary Roche. And Mary Roche says, how dare you attack John Lott? He is brilliant. He was my professor at Wharton. He, his classes were brilliant. And she, she goes as far, Mary, as writing reviews of his books on Amazon, saying, John Lott's book, More Guns, Less Crime, will save your life. Mary Roche was John Lott. It was just this online sock puppet. Yet every time, every time there is a, there is a mass shooting, God forbid, and, and that's the sad part of America. And it's actually one of the saddest parts of doing my radio show in the mornings. I know that several times a year, I'm gonna have to wake up in the morning and talk about some instance of mass death in this country that could be prevented by better policy, right? And that, those are some of the saddest days where I just have to go on air and I'm almost brought to tears by the fact that all of these deaths are in some way present, preventable. But, um, but John Lott, if there's a mass shooting, I guarantee you he's in CNN's green room. He's on NPR. He, it's not, he is given a platform even though the producers that cover him know he's lying. Betsy McCoy, John Lott. Donald Trump, the problem with Donald Trump's uh, amount of press coverage, the, the billion dollars in press coverage that he got in 2015, that's a problem. But that's like a secondary problem. The problem with Donald Trump and the media is in 2011, when Donald Trump was, uh, was a TV, reality TV star. In March of 2011, he goes on Good Morning America and suggests that Barack Obama was, you know, his birth certificate is not real and, and he wasn't born in America. And suddenly he's getting a real platform for this. And the media takes him seriously instead of relegating him to say, you know, if Entertainment Tonight and TMZ had covered it, fine. But CNN and the Nightly News was giving him a platform as a, as a star figure. And when, when that happens, he is elevated into that conversation. And that, look, the, the birth of his presidential campaign was his birther conspiracies in 2011. And the fact the media gave him a platform as a serious individual when, in fact, every single news organization, and I guarantee you every political producer who put Donald Trump on air knew he was lying, knew he wasn't telling the truth, knew this was a, a complete bunch of horse excrement. 
And yet they gave him that platform anyway. Why? Because he's an exciting liar. So the problem is we have a system that allows these, these hackers of our democracy, people like Betsy McCoy and John Lott, to take advantage of the fact that if you can tell an exciting lie, if you can put your lie in front of people, you can, you know, it'll be broadcast. And we have a, and here's the other problem. Betsy McCoy goes on the Jon Stewart show, goes on The Daily Show, carrying two big binders with the health care bill, goes out on stage, puts the binders down, and Jon Stewart houses her for about 10 minutes. I mean, he destroyed her. He made her look like a fool in my eyes, right? He did what you'd want every, you, we'd say we'd want every journalist to do. He basically took her to task and said, you're a liar on national television. And when she tried to, and she just, when she tried to fight back, he called her a liar again. The problem is, by giving her that platform, and studies say this, you, a certain percentage of that population is more likely to believe the lie after seeing that segment. Just by, even if you grant someone a platform to call them a liar, you're reinforcing the lie. Uh, and you see this, and it's not about smart versus dumb people. For example, uh, there have been a number of studies, including by, uh, Prince, uh, by Yale University and other places, that a Republican with more education is more likely to be a climate denier. A Republican with more education is more likely to believe President Obama is a Muslim. So it's not about intelligence or education because those things are actually inversely correlated here. And this is what, this, this group of people, you know, and the story I tell in the book to, to conclude with our book before we take questions is, I start with the tobacco industry, where they go into a meeting in the 1950s at the Plaza Hotel in New York, and the barons of tobacco, all the CEOs and presidents of tobacco groups sit around the table. And at the table is John Hill. John Hill was the founder of Hill and Knowlton, which is one of the largest public relations firms in the world that's now owned by an even larger public relations conglomerate. And John Hill tells them, you have to stop running those ads that I'm sure some of you remember the, the Ronald Reagan ad, smoke, uh, I forget which cigarette it was because it's, it's healthier. He says, stop calling cigarettes, saying your cigarettes are the healthiest. That doesn't do you any good. What we have to do is deny that cigarettes are on, like deny the medical, the, the scientific research on this. And by the way, that scientific research, people don't recognize this. In 1950, it went back 30 years, scientists had been saying, uh, tobacco causes cancer, tobacco is unhealthy. And it was, confer it was pretty much certain in the 1950s. Uh, there was a letter to the editor of the Atlantic magazine that I ran from a, from a doctor just completely excoriating them for publishing tobacco denial. And they saying, what are you guys doing? The, the research is clear. But John Hill goes in this meeting and he tells them this. And you know, we imagine a 1950s meeting Mad Men style Right? We imagine them sitting, and John Hill sitting there smoking a cigarette as he tells them, say cigarettes are healthy. Do you know what the problem is? John Hill wasn't smoking a cigarette in that meeting. Do you know how I know John Hill wasn't smoking a cigarette in that meeting? Because he had quit smoking a few years before because he thought it was unhealthy. Um, John Hill gives them the strategy. By the way, it's a strategy that Hill and Knowlton repeated again and again and again. They, repeat, they did it with the asbestos industry too. Right? Lock in the status quo, keep it keep it going. And you see this strategy moving from tobacco to climate and now to every single issue in particular where progressives want change. We are stymied by this group. And you know, it is a strategy that is used over and over and over again. And one, if we want to succeed, why I wrote this book is because if we want the change we believe in, Electing good people isn't enough. Fighting for the causes we believe in isn't enough. We actually have to defeat this group and, and recognize that without, without truth, there can be no improvement in, in our society. And what I meant by post-truth politics, that's in the title, right? Why are we in a post-truth political age? Because this group has been so successful that it's not that Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals disagree on what they believe. 
like, uh, what, their, what their ideological beliefs and conclusions and policies are. We actually disagree on the fundamental facts. And so you take an issue like climate change, they've been so successful that they've created two different worlds. We're in a post-truth landscape because I have my truth as a progressive. Conservatives have their truth as a conservative. And that means we can't have a debate. For example, on climate change, you know, I would say the earth is warming, humans are the cause, and we need to do something about it. And I've sat on TV and debated a Republican who says, no, the earth is cooling, or the science isn't real. And if, I, if I'm saying the earth is warming and the guy sitting next to me is saying the earth is cooling, you know, maybe we're not, we're not debating what, uh, an issue, we're debating what the thermometer says. And that's, that's not a policy debate. If you go into, if God forbid somebody leaves here and gets into a car accident, and you end up in court, the judge before the trial will say, here are the stipulated facts of the case. This car hit this car, these two cars connected with each other, and then we'll decide who's at fault and who has to pay what money. But there's the fact that the cars hit each other. What this group does is just, there was no car, like they're walking into court and going, there was no car accident. You say, but look at the cars. That happened, that, there was no accident. There, we, we didn't, there didn't, there's, and then there can't be, a de the debate is gone about the car accident because you're stuck debating warm versus cold. If we are going to win, we have to move beyond it. And we have to move into an environment where we can look at issues in a real way, where we can have important debates that matter. And look, debates are actually important. Uh, I have, uh, this might shock a few people, I have some very conservative friends, right, who at least are honest in how they go about engaging in conversation, the facts they use. And I learn more from talking to them and engaging with them and having discussions on issues than I do from even talking to my progressive friends because it challenges my own beliefs, right? And forces me to come up with adequate defenses. And if we can actually discuss policies, the world ends up in a better place. But we are unable to do that. And my goal in writing this book was to start talking about, you know, we talk about money in politics where I started. We talk about lobbying. We have to recognize that the corruption of our democracy is not just money and lobbying, it's also, it's also lies. And if any of you, well, thank you all for being here and listening, and if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Let's start on the right. So, this election season has obviously been a treasure trove of information and I'm as leftist as they come but I have to also recognize that the Bernie movement has created a whole treasure trove of lies. So for example there was this huge meme about Google uh, yesterday monitoring and changing the searches for Hillary where crime came up they, they made it harder to find her crimes. Yep. It was disproved today uh, by several people who looked at it. Um, I, you know, I, I see that you've sort of set this discussion up as a left-right, which I've tended to do as well. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a leftist. Right. But uh, I think this movement has shown us that we're not immune to both sides. I mean, th no, the crazy I, conspiracy theories that we've heard from the left on this side have been really disconcerting to me as well. And, and it, it, I think we have to disabuse this notion that we're immune Oh yeah, no. You're, on the left, you're you're absolutely right about about the idea that you know we are not morally superior as progressives. We are not immune to BS. We are not. There are. I've heard conspiracy theories from progressives about a whole variety of issues that have nothing to do with this election cycle. What what uh, the difference I'm talking about in this book and where it becomes slightly ideological is a a, a kind of mass movement for profit where the, there isn't, first off, if you look at the last seven years, the change dynamic was a Democratic president, so the kind of fight for the status quo was a conservative force against a progressive president, um, is, is the first step why this becomes slightly ideological. And second, it's, you know, people, there are, people believe tons of BS all the time. Um, the problem is, is when they're actually paid and what I'm talking about is the sure, paid I, interest pushing them. But, but I get it, but you also, 
you also deflated the notion that money is the core of all of that at the beginning of your, oh, no, of your talk, it, right? Of and, it's a, and, and that's the core of the sort of the leftist ideas that money is corrupting everything and that anyone who supports Hillary, for example, must be being paid to do so or some level. But it's the ideology, it's, it's sort of tribal, right? Ideology gets to a tribal identification well, this is of why I who you to, are. And right, this is, this is actually when I said at the beginning I was unhappy I released the book in this year is the problem with elections overall, as somebody who's worked on way too many elections and have gotten well out of that business now, is elections aren't about issues and policy, they're about culture and tribalism. Sure. And this goes across the board. It, it's the Republican, look, you look at the never Trump people versus the pro Trump people in the Republican party, that's, that's not ideology, it's, it's tribalism, right? You look at, you look at how people decide to vote, People, uh, people who vote for a certain candidate tend to do it because they relate to that candidate on a cultural level. Um, and I look, money and pol I didn't, if I seem to dismiss the idea that money in politics is a cornerstone of the problems in this, our system, that's actually not what I meant to do at the beginning. I just wanted to point out that it's a triumvirate of forces. Sure. Um, can we, yeah. next question. What do you think are uh, Hillary's biggest lies and Obama's biggest lies? I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, as I, as I stated, look, first line of the book. The first line, you go in the book, is all politicians lie. And this has nothing to do with political parties. All politicians, and the problem with poli political lies, right, are when politicians lie, like the Todd Akin example I gave, they're rarely lying. What they're doing is saying something untrue. Something said to them by an advisor, something said to them by a, a trusted friend, something said to them by a lobbyist, and they're repeating something they fully believe or desperately want to believe is true, but, but isn't. Uh, just to take the Todd Akin example, and then I'll get to your question. So one of the first things I did was look to where did this anti where did this where did this myth lie that if you get raped you can't get pregnant came from so i started i started tracing it and i started looking and what i found was i traced it back to a book through the pro life movement through the anti abortion movement back to a book written in 1973 by anti choicers and the book was called abortion and social justice and in the book one chapter is written by a guy named dr frederick mecklenburg and in the book, he has a chapter about how rape, if a woman is raped, she, it's unlikely she gets pregnant. And he footnotes that to a speech given at Georgetown in the 1960s, went and got the speech. And the speech says that in a study done in Berlin at a, at a prison, at Plotsy prison camp in Berlin in the 1940s, you can imagine what was going on there, um, uh, women were placed in gas chambers and pulled out and it was found they weren't ovulating after that high level of stress moment. There was a, there was a, a big problem with what that was said and it wasn't that it was citing Nazi medicine, that's its own problem. The biggest problem was Plotsy prison was a uh, political prisoner camp, there was no gas chamber. So that study couldn't have taken place there. Now there was a very famous anatomist who worked at that prison camp and he had done studies that said that under prolonged periods of stress, starvation, imprisonment, women's reproductive cycles get disrupted. Now that's very different from if a woman is raped, her, her reproductive system shuts down. And this follows a path through the pro-life movement to the point where what, what, Hiller, what um, Todd Akin is saying, he fully believes. So your question is what it are the biggest lies that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama have told. Um, I mean, that's a, that, it's an intriguing question because here's the thing, that what not, matters not is have they have Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton said things that are untrue? The answer is of course they have because there isn't a single politician in the world. You give me a politician, I can find something untrue they've said. You give me Bernie Sanders, I can find things untrue that he's said. The, and the question isn't, the question is not what politicians lie, the question is 
How do those lies get created and how do they corrupt the system? And this isn't about Democrats versus Republicans. Look, if, if I believe something and you have data that calls my belief into question, I should start questioning my belief. All too often, we ignore one set of data and go with the other. So, I mean, my, my answer is like I, and saying what's the biggest lie is, is also weird. Like how do you measure one lie versus another. I mean, you could say for Barack Obama, the, what was the, uh, you know, you can, if you like your plan, you can keep it, right? Which, you know, clearly did not end up being true, right? Um, now, mind you, anybody who understands healthcare policy would understand that anytime you put in a system, that a certain number of people are going to have to shift plans, especially when you say X number of plans are no longer viable healthcare plans. Why? because they're not really healthcare plans, they're mainly ripping people off and you won't be able to go access those plans that are simply designed to rip people off anymore. Um, should he have said that? I don't, probably not. I mean, but how do you measure, like, is that the greatest of lies? I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't even know how you measure or answer that question. Yeah, my experience uh, when people cite facts to me that are clearly untrue is yeah. that they honestly deeply believe they're true. Right. So I'm wondering, do you, are you, so, and the word lie can sort of encompass, I don't want to stickler on what lie means, but is it your sense that when most of these lies that you are troubled about, or you're talking about, are these at the moment the person is saying them, they are lying, which is to say they know that what they're saying is not true, or is this a situation where most of this stuff that gets said, albeit untrue, the person, when they're saying it, doesn't know that, they, that it's untrue at the time. I would like to believe option two is true because I'd like to believe that we are not a world of sociopaths. I mean, there are certain people in this world who are sociopaths. There are certain people I talk about in this book who are clearly something's wrong upstairs. Um, I've worked for a lot of politicians in my life and some of whom I've had vehement disagreements on issues while I've worked for them and had a tendency to sometimes express those things in a very aggressive way. You can ask Harry Reid about that. Um, but with, with these, you know, I, I tend to believe that when a politician says something, most of the time they believe it because all the incentives are there for them to believe it. You believe, if you're incentivized to believe something, you're going to believe it. If you're, and the fact is we create a perverse system of incentives that allows politicians to believe things that functionally aren't true. And that's actually the problem. The problem is they're saying something untrue, and, but there's somebody who created that. And the Todd Akin example comes up again. He clearly believed, watch the video. You can clearly see he absolutely just, he doesn't even think it's controversial. He's like, yeah, of course, this is what, what's true because he had heard it from the pulpit. He had heard it from trusted people in the anti-abortion movement. He had heard it from friends. He had heard it repeated again and again and again over the years by people he trusted. So, of course, it's true. You know, there are plenty of smart, very smart conservatives who believe climate, who think climate denial is real because they are incentivized to believe it and have heard it over and over and over again from people they trust. And, I mean, that's the sad fact of the situation. Thank you. My question is on AIDS topic. Do you understand me? AIDS okay. topic. So they say the virus of AIDS was originated in laboratory and injected in Central Asia human population in the late 70s. What do you think? Is it lie or truth? I, I didn't quite understand, let me, I, I, what you just proposed is, and I'm just making sure I can answer your question clearly, what you just proposed is that the, uh, the HIV virus, uh, which causes AIDS, was intentionally injected into people in the 1970s in Central Asia? To check his effect. Whose effect? Effect of this virus. I said, not me, but in, in internet, they say, Virus was originated in laboratory and uh, I mean, that, experimented that against, in Central against, Africa. That goes against 
most epidemiological studies about it that go, well, every epidemiological study about it, that, that seems like some stuff on the internet you probably shouldn't trust. It is, is it the truth? No. Thank you. Okay. Well, you sure scared me when you Sorry. talked about 60% of people believing in death panels even after it was disproven. Or unsure. Or unsure. Which is just as bad. And all of the millions of people who are supporting Donald Trump when time after time, whatever he says has been disproven and yep. shown to be a liar. Who are these intelligent conservatives who are educated, who are believing all of these things? And how do we combat them? Um, if truth doesn't combat lies, right. What's your formula? Do you have an answer for us? <laughs> I mean, if I had a complete answer on how to do this, yes. you know, you we'd write be, another book. Write yeah. another book. Uh, no, I mean, I'd, I'd go save the world. I, I think the first step is actually recognizing that this isn't an accident. The first step is, is recognizing that this is an intentional exploit of our democracy because we don't actually realize, you know, it's one thing if it's you know randomly happening, but it's not. It's recognizing the pattern. The second is actually holding liars, the liars who make up these lies accountable. Isolating them from what they desire most, which in a lot of cases is attention for their lies. And if we start enforcing that as a, as a population, saying we're not accepting this as, as our reality, if you, if you are a liar, you no longer get your platform, that would have the biggest impact. Because there's no, there's no law, this isn't campaign finance, there's no law we could pass that says, you know, there's no, con there's, and, and any constitutional amendment you could create to deal with this would actually be dangerous, right? Because I don't want a government board deciding what's truth and what's lies because right. God forbid Ted Cruz becomes president and <laughs> like imagine what that government board will determine is what's truth and what, what's lies. So we're kind of limited, like there's no, well, here's the law, if we pass this law, problem solved, which would be nice, you know, it'd be a nice wrap up for the book. Here's the law that will fix this. Um, it's, it's about us as a society starting to hold each other accountable to this, starting not to shy away from it, starting to have difficult conversations and beginning to actually identify this as real. And that's not the end solution. We kind of, we're, yes, we're in a very scary place in our democracy for a number of reasons, and not just because a racist demagogue is now the nominee of a major political party. Uh, we're in a system where, you know, there are people out there who will, who will seek to prevent any change, and we, we do need to stand up to it. Thank you. Yep. Are you a voice in the wilderness, <laughs> or or do you have colleagues, friends, who are supportive and feeling that this is a movement that should do something? Um, you see I'd, what I mean? I, I'd like to not think I'm a voice in the wilderness. That would be, I, I, think, I think it's, be, look, here's, here's what's interesting, and I found this, when I wrote, so in 2009, I wrote a proposal for my first book, The Fox Effect. And in this proposal, I had this radical notion that Fox was not a news network, but a, but a representative of a political party. Now, here's what's amazing. When I wrote that proposal, that was a controversial idea. Anita Dunn, who was White House Communications Director at the time, said it, and she would, like Jake Tapper and all these people went out on TV and pilloried her. They said, how, how dare you suggest that our colleagues at Fox News are a political machine and not a, and not a party? Now, and I wrote this proposal and they were like, wow, that's a, that's a new suggestion, and we laid out like why, how this took place and the way they acted like that and how essentially they are this. And the publisher was like, wow, this is like amazing and fresh. And by the time we got done with the book in 2012, uh, in 2011, uh, Politico wrote a piece saying, yeah, Fox is just, I'm gonna, we have to start treating Fox, stuff on Fox like we treat press releases from the Republican National Committee. You know, it's a press release and then we'll, we'll deal with the facts from there. And I was like, oops, we won. Right, that's, because that's all you, you you're not going to shut down Fox News, it's way too profitable. But the problem with Fox was misinformation, misinformation is dangerous when it metastasizes, 
right? If, if it just sticks in its own silo, it can kind of float around and who cares, but it, when it spreads, it gets dangerous and things used to bounce. You'd hear a smear on Fox and it would bounce all over the place. That actually stopped at a certain point and that disempowered them in a very real way. Um, the, you know, I'd like to think, you know, fact checking over the past four years has taken new advances. Um, you know, you see media actually be willing to call people liars now. That didn't exist a few years ago. Now, we need more steps and needs to, they need to take kind of the next step, but we're moving in that direction. I also think consumers are getting much more sophisticated about how they consume information. I, this is about information consumption, right? My, my friend Clay Johnson wrote a book called The Information Diet. And he said the problem with how we consume information is that pizza tastes better than broccoli. And because if you put a plate of pizza in front of me and a plate of steamed broccoli, right, I'm really gonna wanna eat that slice of pizza. I'm gonna be honest, I don't want that steamed broccoli. No salt, just a plain steamed broccoli. I don't want it, right? But I know that if I ate the pizza every day, I'd get sick, right? That's not healthy, so I have to balance the pizza and the broccoli. But in our information diets, we don't make that balance. We go for the pizza all the time because it's warm and comforting and it makes you feel so good inside and it tastes so delicious when you're, when you, and media becomes entertainment. I think that's the next, next step is recognizing that we need a healthy information diet as well as a healthy nutrition diet. Yeah, well, I guess my question is related to this. Um, given the fact that it's the media that give the liars their platform, yep. How do you get the media to stop publishing or talking about only the exciting stuff, well, not the real stuff, just I mean, the ex How do you get them to stop? It's a question of what defines exciting, right? And how they define exciting, because I think the media often uh, misdefines what's exciting. Look, I'm excited to talk about how terrible the TPP is. That, ex that excites me, right? I, there were, there was a set of TPP negotiations taking the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a massive uh, 13 country trade deal that's been negotiated by the Obama administration, if people need background on it. And there was a negotiation going on in Washington DC and protests outside. And I started calling around every TV news producer I, I, and I said, I know you haven't covered TPP to this point because you wouldn't see it on TV anywhere. But there are these, pro there's a negotiation going on literally a block from the White House and there are protests, like you'll get pictures, go, well, nobody cares about trade, it's not exciting. I don't think that's true. I, look, I, I, my first campaigns I did, I was in Columbiana County and, and, um, and Youngstown, Ohio. You go there, you go to Youngstown, Ohio, you go to Columbiana County, you see those hollowed out steel mills and you tell me people don't care about trade there. You tell me they're not interested in a trade, that's all they talk about is trade and guns. Pretty much. I mean, the, you, you, you've seen these people have their lives get gutted out by trade treaty after trade treaty after trade treaty, and they're not stupid about it. Um, so it's a question of what's exciting. It's not a question, it's, and how you frame exciting, you know, and how it's, and I think the media makes a mistake as to what's entertaining uh, because it's easy. Because in the end, when I, when I worked on John Kerry's campaign, I, I traveled with John Kerry during, I worked for him during the general election in 2004. I started that campaign in April, April 15th, actually, 2004. And I spent the summer on the road with him. Um, and one of the things that I, look back, that I look back on that was amazing is there was a photographer on the road with John Kerry at the time who was carrying film cameras and would take sets of pictures in 2004 for magazine covers and mail the film back to headquarters once a week. And I, I said, can you, today, that person is emailing 30 pictures a day. The report, there were reporters who were traveling on the road with John Kerry who would file one story a week, right? Because that's all the media was consumed. Now, uh, reporters out there fi has to file four or five stories a day, plus do TV hits, plus do radio, which means they're just, and the media industry is so all over the place that, you know, these people are in constant competition for their jobs, meaning they're going for what's quick and easy. And it's, it's partially convincing people to do what's right over doing what's quick. 
Um, about four or five years ago, there was a story in the newspaper about a lawsuit against a company called the AbCycle Pro exercise machine or something. I don't know what it was. But it guaranteed that people would lose 10 pounds in a month if they if Really? They Tell it. me about this product. And, and uh, yeah, I, well, a lot uh, of people please. were excited about it. A lot of people bought it and didn't lose 10 pounds. And they mounted a class action lawsuit against it. And they won. And the makers of the AbCycle Pro wound up having to pay out $25 million to people that got duped by this device. And when I read that, I mean, I've always been real concerned about how our electoral system works. And I thought, you can launch a, le a, a web, uh, excuse me, a lawsuit and, and you can win a $25 million lawsuit against a company for lying about weight loss. Why can't we do the same thing when a politician puts out an ad that has a piece of information in it that's absolutely demonstrably false. Because Why don't we have a truth in advertisement law for politicians? Because I, lying is constitutionally protected speech. I'm not joking about that. Well, uh, I, I, don't, I know that, I understand that. Uh, I mean, it's, there was a lawsuit in Ohio. Lo Ohio actually has a rule similar to what you're suggesting. They have a board and four uh, groups in the state, it, you can't really do it with electeds, officials and people running for office, but for if you're like an issue campaign running an ad in an election, the, there's a board in Ohio that under the law that says like, if your ad's a lie, we'll take it down. Um, and, and one of these, uh, Susan B. Anthony's list, which is a, which is a uh, anti-abortion group, it's, a, it's supposed to be the Republican version of Emily's list and they end up, which is the Democratic, you know, endorsing pro-choice female candidates. Um, the uh, Susan B. Anthony's list will often in, has endorsed in the past uh, pro-life male candidates to run against Emily's list candidates. So it shows how well they do it their business. But they launch an ad about Obamacare against a congressman. He said it was saying he was anti-abortion because he was pro-abortion because he voted against this. He voted for Obamacare, and he said, "I've been anti-abortion my entire. What are you talking about now? We can debate abortion, but you know." It, it, this suit ended up going to the Supreme Court and Susan B. Anthony's list actually ended up winning that suit about, and it was some billboards, but there is this board in Ohio that does what you say. The problem is, w with the First Amendment, it becomes imperfect. Now, what's interesting is the Exxon case where I brought up, which I brought up earlier, when it involves money, it's actually a lot easier, right? So there have been suggestions that several state attorney generals can take action against Exxon because they deceive their shareholders as to as to this, which is a clear financial interest in their company, and you're not allowed, in America, you're allowed to lie about a lot of things, but you're not allowed to lie about money. That's, anyway, I think we're wrapping on time, and uh, I really want to thank you all for coming on this Friday night, and uh, I'll be signing books over there.